What's up my fellow actors, Kurt Yu here from ActingCareerCenter.com. I'm really excited to share with you today a recent interview I did with New York-based actor Juan Ayala. Juan played Agent Woods on multiple episodes of the NBC show Blind Spot, which recently had its series finale. Now, this conversation is a continuation of a conversation that I had with Juan on his podcast, Actors with Issues. I appeared on episode 10 of his podcast, which you can listen to by searching for Actors with Issues on whatever podcast platform that you use. Now, before we get into our conversation, I want to remind you that if you are new to this channel, make sure to subscribe to get more videos on acting, auditioning, and career advice every single week. Also, if you're interested in learning my 10-step audition preparation process that has helped me book multiple movies and television shows, then I've created a free audition cheat sheet that you can download by going to that link right up there. All right, let's move on to my conversation with Juan. Juan talks about how he started off in music and musical theater when he was younger and then later transitioned into film and television work. And he talks about those lessons that he learned while making that transition. He also talks about how he moved from Connecticut to New York City to pursue acting and how he was able to get auditions and book jobs before ever getting representation. He booked multiple commercials, plus a recurring role on the show Blind Spot on NBC, all before having an agent. So this is great information for people that are just starting out and don't have an agent and want to learn how to use their network to get those opportunities. So without any further ado, here's my conversation with Juan Ayala. Juan, welcome to my YouTube channel. How are you doing today? <laughs> thanks, Kurt. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm doing good. You know, hanging in there. <laughs> good, good. So you and I have very different paths in our acting careers. I, I mean, I started much, much later than you did. I think you mentioned on one of your podcasts that are you currently, you're 26 years old. Is that right? I just turned 27 a couple weeks ago. You just turned 27. So um, basically I was your age when I started, when I took my <laughs> first acting class, I was 26. So when I was 27, I was like, I hadn't even gotten an agent yet. Like I was just yeah. barely just getting started. So tell us about how you started your, your acting life. Sure. Uh, so it, <laughs> I'm having trouble finding words. Uh, like many people, it started with music. Um, okay. I feel like with a lot of uh, actors, they either started in musical theater, they grew up singing. And for me, I grew up singing in a very musical church. It was like a Spanish Pentecostal church, very music heavy, um, a lot uh. of Latin music, which is really cool. Um, so I grew up singing and around music a lot. So you know, that led to me uh, you know, joining the school choirs and performing in school and whatnot. And then I did my first acting, anything, first musical um, uh, in eighth grade. And then right after that, we moved to a new town and I was like way too shy. Where, where was this? Yeah. Where was um, this? I'm from Connecticut. in oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so not too far from the city. We're about an hour and a half away. Uh, gotcha. quick, not quick, but short ride uh, from the train. And um but then I moved to like a nearby suburb. I didn't know anybody in the school and I was a really shy kid. So I was too scared to audition for like any of the musicals that they did. They did like one big show every year. Mm -hmm. um, but I joined the choirs, sort of, you know, broke out of my shell. And then um, my junior year, I did my first show since that eighth grade one. Um, it was like a big musical review that they put together basically to like bridge the gap between urban and suburban communities which mm -hmm. is really cool like kids from all high schools from all surrounding towns would do the show and then my senior year I did like the big musical at my high school um and that's really when I like I'd always loved singing but getting a role in like a full production was just like it was very different it wasn't as and it was that character specifically was not a singing role so I Oh. I think they gave me a couple little random things that usually go to other people. Um, but it was Fiddler on the Roof, and there's a lot of several roles in that. Um, and I played one of, like, the lovers of one of the daughters. And um, it basically, that's when it really started for me. was like, oh, like, I'm acting now. Like, there's no music mm -hmm. to drive my emotions. I get to just, like, talk. And there's, like, it was one of the, I was one of the few characters that actually had, like, several scenes. Um, and no singing to do 
And that's always been, I know that's a challenge for a lot of people. They're like, when I'm like in a musical, I can act my ass off, but then once I'm in a play, I'm like horrified because there's no violin to cue me to be sad or whatever. So um, that's really when I got started. And then after my senior year and I was applying for colleges, I was initially applying for criminal justice because I wanted to be an attorney. Um, oh, interesting. But then, but then the, the community college I ended up going to, they're the only community college in Connecticut with an actual theater program. So I was like, screw it. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to dive in. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's basically um, my, my beginning. Wait, so did you, so college. did you apply to the theater program instead of criminal justice? Yeah. So since it was a theater, I mean, since it was a community college, it was, uh, um, you know, they just, you do what you, you just, do. There's no like start in. Gotcha. to get into any particular program. Um, in the theater, I, I, you know, was a theater arts major and, and that, college uh who's atomic um which is a community college in connecticut really changed the game for me it was a mm. tiny program mm -hmm. and it was all drama driven there was mm. no musical elements to anything so again mm. i got to learn how to act mm. without music without choreography without the lavish costumes it's like nope everyone's gonna wear black because we're gonna do improv and you use mm. props and you have these elements of color and all this other stuff um and it's just like acting to its core and how simple it is, but also how complex it can be depending on the role. Yeah. Um, and that really was just super eye-opening for me. And my professor there, Jeff, also let me produce a ton of stuff because there was no musical stuff. I was like, can I write a show? So then I wrote a musical uh, and wrote, you know, directed a few concerts and stuff to bring- You wrote an entire home. musical by yourself? Wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was a uh, that was intense. Not something that I would see myself doing professionally. Maybe composing music because I did like, as I fell in love with music growing up, I you know started taking piano lessons and and teaching myself as well, um, chords and 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 songwriting and all that stuff. So maybe like if I ever like direct a short or something that I do myself, I might write the music for that too, just to sort of re-implement that from my childhood. But uh. Yeah, that's basically my that's, You know, it's really interesting because, again, um, we're on complete opposite ends of the spectrum because uh, that's one of my biggest fears in acting is to book a role where they ask me to do something musically uh, mm. related because I have zero musical talent at all. If you want me to sing or dance or anything, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be bad. <laughs> so that, that's, that's one of my fears. And the funny thing is, I've, I've had a conversation with other people about this, and this is kind of off topic, but um, just from like a music standpoint, I think it's really mm. interesting because you said you got started when you were pretty young. And um, I just, I feel like it's, it's one of those things, and acting is, I think there's part of this applies to acting as well, that there, there is some part of it that you're kind of quote unquote born with. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, you can learn everything, anything can be learned, but I think some people are starting at a different level than other people. Like for me, if I, if, like, if I grew up my, and my dream was to become a musician, like I'm starting like so low below so many people. Um, because here's the thing, I even played the cello when I was uh, a, from like fourth grade through high school. So for many years, I played the cello in the string orchestra in school, but I never could like, over all those years, never developed an ear for music. I couldn't tune my own instrument. Um, and even to this day, when I like sing karaoke, I have to watch the word scroll on the screen even though they're like songs that i have memorized i know all the words to them but i just can't get you know yeah. i won't be singing you know in 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 rhythm or anything so it's just really interesting when i hear people when they're really young like you just like start off in music um do you think you had like did you have a musical talent before you started taking any lessons like did you already know that you had a little bit of that in you I think I always had a good ear for stuff because mm. I mean, I didn't take lessons until maybe like eighth grade. That's when, like I said before, like that's when a lot of like artistic yeah. stuff really started coming into my life beyond just yeah. singing in church on Sundays. Um, I think I always did have an ear for it because I grew up singing a lot and it's just like, you just have to match what they're singing. No one's going to teach you the new song at church. You're just right. going to hear it and, and catch it. Um, and with, my dad initially bought a keyboard in this massive encyclopedia like this thick yeah. of like piano chords so that he could learn 
and he was, you know, in his thirties by that point, by the time I was like seven or eight years old. And, um, he just couldn't get it. He, yeah. he said, and it's funny that I ended up like plucking out songs from church. just like note by note, like one at a time, wow. nothing elaborate. And then I would like write with a Sharpie on the keys. Like this is an A and that's a B and that's a C sharp. Cause I couldn't capture any of that yet. No one had told me. Um, but I think, I mean, you're right. I think that with music, especially there are certain things that like, just that side of the brain, whichever side it is, I don't know which side, yeah. but, you know, that captures and that absorbs that stuff easier. Um, I find it similar to like languages and things like that. Cause when you're a kid, you yeah. can absorb any language, but yeah. if you try teaching a 15 year old Spanish, they're not going to be as quickly fluent as they could have been if you started when they were like three. Hmm. So, so you mentioned but, that your dad had uh, bought that book to try to teach himself piano. Was he, yeah. so was he music to, musically talented other than that? beforehand no Did you play I other think instruments? That, no no no, no okay no. <laughs> anybody, anybody yeah. else in your family who's kind of artistic at all i mean almost everyone sings in some capacity just because we all went to the same church as a okay. Hispanic yeah. family my mom is like one of 10 kids so we have sure. a lot have a lot of cousins sure um and you know we all love singing together as kids and like you know watching like high school musical and singing to the disney movies but you know that's yeah like, so we grew up around music a lot, but no one really stuck with it or pursued it. Like a few cousins like started learning guitar, one cousin learned drums, but like it was like a passing um, interest and then it just went away. I was kind of the only one that really stuck with it. Mm. Okay, cool. All right, let's, let's, let's transition back into acting now. <laughs> uh, so uh, now that, now that you, you've finished school and you've gone through this whole acting program, and I know now you are based in New York City. So what eventually kind of led you to New York City? That's kind of what I wanted to focus uh, this video on because I haven't really talked to anybody who's uh, currently a New York City based actor. So I'd love to hear mm -hmm. how you ended up in New York and uh, kind of your time there right now. So um, there was this theater um, called the Bijou Theater in um, like a few blocks away from my, from my college that I was working at for a while. I did a few shows there because they were starting to produce their own theater. So they do musicals and plays. And I was like, cool, something for me to do outside of college. And it's a few blocks away. So I can just go to rehearsal after class. Um, and then I started working there and started um, assisting with some of the production stuff. Um, like I, they had me like direct one of the kids, children's theater shows that they did on the weekends and stuff. Um, and after several years, I think I was there for maybe four years, just doing shows constantly and working there as well. Um, they ended up closing. So the owner at the time um, had to basically give it up. She couldn't afford to continue paying for it because it was a huge space. It was like 200 seat, um, like half theater and half cabaret. There was like a full bar at the front. It was like a really cool space. So they did a lot of concerts and stuff. Um, and then when they closed down, I didn't know what to do because I'm like, I've been here for four years. Like, I did all of the shows here and if I didn't do them, then I was involved in some other aspect. So I really didn't know what to do. And I was out of college at that point and I was just kind of like a little lost. Um, and then something popped up on Facebook saying that there was like a Hallmark Channel Christmas movie that was filming downtown blocks away from the theater and from my college mm. and they needed um, extras. And I was like, mm. well, this is paid. Like, why not? And it paid yeah. pretty decently at the time. Um, this was in 2016 um and i you know signed up to do it and then um they cast me as like a as like a wardrobe because the show took the, the movie took place in like a today show type thing and it was set in new york but it, they shot in connecticut um yeah and melissa joan hart was in it and so was dean kane they were like the two leads um and they were basically like two people competing for like a new spot of, as a co-host and um, so, you know, they cast me as like um, a non-speaking extra, but I was like the wardrobe guy. So I was like the wardrobe stylist. Um, and there were a lot of other extras on the set. And I was like, how did you guys hear about this? Because I found out about this on Facebook. Like, do you guys, are you guys actors? Do you guys do this for a living? And they're like, oh, we all came in from New York because it's like super close. It was like an hour and a half on the train. Um, and they're like, and the pay for this is better than it, what is in New York right now. So we came in and did this and I'm like, but you guys do this like all the time. Like you guys are like extras on like different shows. And, you know, they told me like, oh, you have to go to this website, uh, casting network, go on Actors Access, go do this, go do that. So 
I really wouldn't be where I am if it weren't for the kindness of other people who are willing to answer my questions. So that's why um, I'm very active in like the acting Reddit um, community because a lot of similar to the comment section of your videos, a lot of kids are asking like, how do I do this? And I'm like, all right, here's what you gotta do. You know, just get training. Don't worry about an agent right now. That's, that's a couple years down the road. Um, but you know, after all those people had told me all these different things, like you have to sign up on this website, go to this. Um, then I started submitting for work in New York and um, not too short or not too long after, um, I booked my first commercial. Um, it was a sprint commercial for Father's Day, and they were looking for actual father-son pairing. So me and my dad actually did it together. And this is something you submitted yourself for. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Great. Um, because they were looking for like actual pairings and not like sure. actors. Sure. Um, it was like one of those testimonial type uh, commercials. Um, so me and my dad did that, and then I'm like, okay, there's something, you know, there's got the ball rolling. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, so then eventually, so I just started submitting myself a lot. Um, I would work as an extra on a few shows, um, that would book me frequently. Um, like I worked on like Law and Order for a little bit, um, and some other New York shows. But then like once I did enough of that, I was like, okay, let's start figuring out how to get some speaking roles because I'm like, extra stuff's fun, but it's really long hours for not that great pay. And it's not moving your career forward. It's a paycheck, but it's not moving me forward. So I really wanted to take that next step. So, um, right. so yeah. So then I, after a couple of years, I had um, my mentor who has been in the entertainment business for like 30 years, but on the journalism side, he's been like a, a reporter and a critic and all that stuff. He was actually a producer of a play I did at the Bijou Theater um, called Take Me Out. It was like an all-male cast, super diverse cast. And he saw something in our cast and he was like, we've got a kind of a good thing going here is like this is like a young diverse group from uh, you know uh, inner city like I could maybe get some meetings going because he's met like every casting director and every person ever um so he you know helped me get into the audition room for a few different things and the first thing I ended up booking was Blind Spot um that was my very first co-star Wow. Um, and then a year later, they called me. So again, me that one was without representation, getting that audition? Correct. Yeah, wow. yeah. I was also taking some workshops with casting directors at the sure. time. Um, at some different spots, you know, you do like some scene work and then they'll give you feedback. And if they're interested, they'll reach out to the person who runs the, the workshop and be like, hey, well, this, can you give this person's email or their actor's access link or something? I just want to keep them on my roster mm -hmm. or, you know, on my radar. Um, so that also really helped was because otherwise you're not going to get in the audition room without an agent. Right. And it's sort of that, like that sort of catch 22 that yep. happens a lot in every industry. It's like, we're only hiring people to experience or how am I supposed to get experience if no one's hiring without any? Yeah. So it's like that with acting too, you know, um, it's hard to get into the audition room in any major market without yeah. an agent, unless they're holding open calls or anything, which yeah. in New York at least does not happen very much. Um, but that's sort of what led me to New York is eventually I was like, um, after my first episode of Blind Spot aired, that was in 2018, um, about a year later, was it about a year later? Yeah, it was, um, early 20, it was actually right around Valentine's Day of 2019, um, that they called me back to the show and they said, Hey, we have another scene in the lab. We want to have you back. Um, and you had no idea when you worked on it the first time that it, w it could be a recurring character? No, I had no, and no, I had, there was no indication that that's what it would be. Yeah. Um, just because it was a lab tech. He comes in and says, yeah. The old team just called in. They found it, you know, like, it's like, uh, just reporting information and then going. And right. Those characters are expendable. If someone's not available, right. they'll just hire another guy. Um, and, uh, they called me back for my second episode. And then I sort of had put my reel together. I had everything updated on all the websites and, you know, on those websites, the casting network is one that I use a lot. Um, I'm not sure if it is um, in, uh, in other markets, but I use it on the East Coast a lot. Um, reps can find you if you mark yourself as seeking representation. So once they put in like Latin actor, male 20s, you know, all of the people that fit that criteria will pop up and my agent found me. Interesting. Um, I had, yeah, I had not submitted to them. Um, they're in the Southeast market. So they have offices in Atlanta and Nashville. So right in your neck of the woods in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, 
yeah, we had a meeting and they liked what they saw because they liked my etch outs, they liked my reel, they saw I had sort of picked up some momentum without the reps. And um, in the summer of 2019, very shortly after I actually signed with them is when I finally moved. And my plan in 2019 was to move. Mm -hmm. um, I love Connecticut, but the Metro North train is expensive. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> having to be on set at 6 a.m. and I'm like two hours away and right. it was just exhausting. I'm like, I'm losing years off of the end of my life here. Yeah. Uh, so I just, I really wanted to move and, and be closer to the action. Right when I got my agent, I was already set to move like the following week. So I'm like, this works out perfectly. Um, and I figured like if they're going to be submitting me for stuff and there's like last minute changes, I don't want to be like, Oh, I'm two hours away in Connecticut. It's like, no, I'm in Brooklyn. I'll be there in 20 minutes. You know, it's like, yeah. I just want to be closer to everything because it just felt like the right time to do so. Um, and uh, yeah, my agent has been pretty great so far. Um, they've gotten me into the room for a few shows at film and, and uh, not in the room, but you know, sub tape <laughs> requests uh, yeah. for a few of the Southeast um, market shows. But um I've loved my experience with them and then recently signed with the manager, but we can talk about that later. <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's really cool. I, I, I know how difficult it can be obviously to get into uh, the audition room for anything, especially in the big markets like New York and LA. And obviously it's, it's hard here in Atlanta as well, but I know, you know, in a market like New York where it's so saturated with actors, it can be super hard and to be able to do that on your own without representation um, I think it's great for uh, actors to be able to hear that too, because everybody thinks that, you know, I have to, I got to go get an agent. I got to go get an agent and they don't really pursue anything on their own. Um, and I think it's also important to know that you got to keep doing that. Even when you're, when you have the representation, you know, you still got to keep building those relationships because it's ultimately it's your career. It's not your agent's career. Right. Um, so uh, let's actually let's talk more about uh, blind spot because that's that's really cool. I don't I don't have um, cable, so I don't get to watch any of the episodes. But I it's been great because you've been posting some of your clips, and I, I've <laughs> seen some of your your latest clips on uh, online. So it, it's it's tell me about the feeling when you first found out that you well one when you found out you booked the uh booked it the first time and then when you got the phone call or the or the email or whatever it was that they wanted to bring you back so it's funny because it was one of those the audition was like i saw the i like read the room and saw the other actors that were in the waiting room and i'm like am i like the different direction because there are a lot of handsome people in here like not <laughs> the traditional like quirky techie types that i very much am Sure. Uh, and there was like an, uh, an older gentleman, maybe like late 30s. He was in like a full black suit, like FBI. And I'm like, I thought this was a lab tech. I'm like, maybe they're just reading other roles. Maybe I'm just getting mm -hmm. in my own head a little too mm -hmm. much. Um, but it's such a straightforward role. It's just like, you know, I come in, say like, I found something. Uh, the field team, I think my, my first episode was like, the field team just called in. Mm -hmm. The little sky employee said they saw a truck drive off. And then one of the principals, um because they get a license plate no but the truck had a marking on it a red star with seven points there's no room for acting in there it's just yeah. information information yeah and with new york shows especially all of these procedurals like law and order and blue bloods and all these shows there with those small roles there's like no room for acting and i knew that for this particular audition it's like now is not your time to shine no one's going to discover you <laughs> with this right. three-line role right so just get in someone had told me like for co-star auditions get in and get out like mm -hmm. that's it you're not making an impression you're mm -hmm. a lab tech so talk like a lab tech dress like a lab tech and just do it and if they like it then they'll keep you in mind call you back or book you for it um and i also made sure in terms of like wardrobe i didn't want to go in in a full fbi suit like yes he's an fbi agent but he works in a lab he's not a field agent you know or like a, an investigator so i that's also a big factor with with a lot of these sort of shows that there is like a hierarchy in all these different ranks within like the FBI and, the, and NYPD and all these different things. Mm -hmm. So that's also something that I really knew to take into account. Is like, don't, don't go in with a uniform, but like suggest the role uh, in a way. Yeah. I think that's something that's overlooked a lot. Cause yeah. there's another guy in there with like a uh, white shirt and jeans. And I'm just like, what show are we auditioning for? <laughs> yeah. I was just very confused with, with, like I said, with a variety of people in the room. And I'm like, there must be more than one. Today, 
Um, it, well, you know, it's funny because I've always kind of been, I've, I've, I've been taught the same thing of going kind of dressed to suggest the role. Um, but then you also see, I mean, there, there, that's, that's kind of the rule of thumb, but yeah. there's always exceptions, right? There's always someone that comes in dressed in full cop uniform or something and they'll book it and they'll say, Hey, this is what you got to do. <laughs> or yeah. you'll, you'll have someone who comes in. Um, I, I'm, I've seen this happen. Like I, there was one time where I was, I auditioned for a role of a cop for a movie and they ended up casting two different roles off of that audition and the two actors they cast, I distinctly remember seeing both of these people at the audition. One was a girl who was dressed full uniform badge and everything. Another was a guy who just black t-shirt, like nothing, nothing beyond that. Yeah. And those were the two, like those were kind of two extremes of what people were wearing, but those were the two people that they cast. So ultimately it still comes down to, you know, your performance still is the main yeah. factor, but, uh, but it's interesting how there is kind of a big, um, uh, you, the the whole spectrum ends up showing up at at auditions, yeah. and uh, you don't know exactly what they're going to go with. Um, yeah. But that, that's so that's that's so cool. So like you have to look like your headshot when you walk into the audition. Yeah, room. yeah, yeah. So it's like if that's the headshot that your rep submitted or that they chose off of that you submitted on your profile, then dress like that. And you know that's kind of my whole thing with like too much makeup or airbrushing because I see it a lot in headshots. Mm -hmm. and i'm like are you gonna do all that makeup every single mm -hmm. time you have an audition like you're mm -hmm. just like adding more work for yourself right um and that was a big thing too was like which headshot did i submit for this one and yeah yeah or, or which one did i show them at the workshop and things like that um so what did you think when you found out when you got the phone call or the email or whatever it was that uh that you were uh that you got offered the role <laughs> i freaked out i really did i was so ecstatic because it had been, I had done three commercials prior to that, or like two commercials and a promo, uh, you know, like internet promo, it's a loophole to get you there. Um, yeah. But I hadn't booked any like network or, or cable or any sort of television or film, a couple short films, but nothing like, you know, nothing major. So that was like my first major booking. And I'm like, well, crap, now I'm going to be like SAG eligible. And that's like a huge thing too, is like joining the union and, and that mm -hmm. opens up all these opportunities. Um, but I was really, I was ecstatic. I, I remember like seeing the email, I think I was in my kitchen and I like almost dropped my phone. <laughs> yeah. And then I put, I think I have it on like on my Instagram. So, um, I like took a selfie video and like just like swirled it around and I was like, yes, you just got their first co star. <laughs> I was so excited. And my That's mentor was great. thrilled for me because he's like, okay, so like, cause it's one of those things that, you know, he got me the audition. Right. but he he made it very clear he's like i had nothing to do with you getting the role he's like, yeah remember that like don't think that i made anything happen he's like we got you the opportunity and then you took the opportunity like, yeah i showed you the door you opened it it's like yeah and i think that's very big too is that um a lot of young actors think that they have a rep now and all their problems are solved but it's like no i mean they got 10 percent commission you still have to yep. do that other 90 percent of the work like, exactly Hey, let me jump in for a sec. If you're liking this video so far, do me a favor and give it a thumbs up. And don't forget that you can listen to Juan interview me on his podcast, Actors With Issues. All right, let's get back to it. This is going back a little bit. I remember my my day on set. Yeah. I had no idea what to expect because again, you, I worked on a couple of short films and oh, right. had tiny crews and right. you know, like they're like guerrilla type filmmaking they're like out in the street nobody has permits for for these like shorts or these like super small promos um so i really didn't i heard stories from a few friends who worked as extras on the show that the set was massive it's like the whole fbi offices floor is connected via a bunch of hallways that they also use for shooting to the fbi lab and both it was like a maze like it's just like mm -hmm. hallways and tunnels and all this different stuff. So the set was massive in this very big studio that was in Brooklyn. Um, I think it's like the biggest studio in New York right now. Mm. Um, but I really had no idea what to expect. And, and you know, one of the actors was really nice. And, you know, um, a few of them, I mean, they're all a great cast. I loved, I loved going back to work on that show so many times. Um, but, you know, they were very welcoming. One of them, like, when I was getting my mic put on, he was like, hey, welcome to the team. And I was like, that was cool. Yeah. <laughs> He's like the head FBI honcho on the show. And I was like, that yeah. was cool. Um, and they're just very welcoming. And when I had like fumbled on a line, when the camera wasn't on me, it was like for a turnaround. Um, one of the actors who was 
um, had been on the show before, but this was his first season as a regular. So he was also, he had done a ton of TV before. Um, mm -hmm. He's a fairly known face. Um, but he was like, don't worry about being perfect. Like the cameras are on you. So, you know, just relax, take breaths. He's like, you know, it's all on us right now. So you don't have to worry about like perfection. I was like, okay, I, I, I don't have to worry. And that was awesome. just really reassuring to hear like yeah. a professional working actor give some advice. Cause I've heard also stories where people are like, don't ever talk to the principal actors. Don't bother them. And I'm yeah. like, oh, that sounds yeah. horrible. But, yeah. but with that cast in particular, a lot of them, this was like their first network show, their first series regular um, for the majority of that cast. Um, so it was just really cool to be with another group of people who a few years prior were kind of in my situation. So I was trying to find the next gig and now they were regulars. Yeah, it's really, yeah, totally. 100 episodes. Yeah. Very inspiring to see that, to yeah. see people, other people's success. Uh, so, so then after... After you finish that, you kind of just after that day on set, you kind of assumed that it was it was over for Blind Spot, right? Yeah, because um, you know I'd watch, I was a fan of the show before I had gone to work on it, so mm -hmm. I was like, they don't really have that many lap techs because one of the characters is like the head lap tech, mm -hmm. and then this new character or or character who had been on who came was the series regular for the first time uh, for season three, he was sort of like. It was like the two of them in the lab. So I'm like, they have they have extra la like extras lab techs in the back, but there's no like co-stars or whatever because they already have two people delivering all that information. They don't need new characters. So I just assumed like that was cool, that was fun, but I guess that's it. Um, yeah. And then it was just under a year later that um that I got an email saying, you know, um, hey, they're doing another thing in the lab. They need a few lab techs and they wanted to bring back some familiar faces. So do you want to, or are you available for these dates to come back? I said, do you want to come back? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, so then with that one, I was like, cause there's a, a whole process with, um, with joining SAG. Once you like book your first principal role, you're eligible. You don't have to join just yet. And then once you do your second one, you get like a, basically like a 30 day trial to be SAG. So then I called the SAG office. I was like, hi, I'm booked for this date. Can I start my like 30 day thing like on that day? And just so that I don't have to join like just yet. Yeah. Um, Cause I had also heard from my agent at, or, or from several people um, from like agents and managers and, and whatnot. Everyone had said like, wait as long as possible to join SAG because if right. you're getting in the audition room, you have nothing to worry about. Right. Just, just have that like chunk of savings ready <laughs> to pay that fee. Cause it's a hefty fee. Um, but you know going back to the show is really cool because you know they're like the director was like hey guys we have one and a few other people coming back today um and you know the the principal cast was, was really nice. like hey like you know how have you been like it's been a year like how how's yeah. it how's everything going right. um and i hadn't moved to the city at that point um but um but that was just really fun to get to come back and sort of be welcomed back by by the cast and whatnot um and then again, even more so, uh, another, or actually, no, it wasn't a year later. It was, so that was in February of 2019. And then in um, October, they had asked me if I was available for the series finale. They said, we're basically bringing everyone back. Like anyone who has been on the show, if they fit into the story, we're going to bring them back for the finale. Um, so I was like, absolutely, I would love to. Like, that's an honor to be on like your the finale, like the 100th episode. Like, you know, that's like that milestone every series wants to reach because then they get syndicated and everyone wants to get. Syndicated. Wait, that's the series finale or the season finale? The series, yeah. So that the we, show's over. Uh, one more episode next Thursday. Oh, okay. The finale is next Thursday. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. The finale, finale. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that was the uh, we actually filmed that way back in November. The episode that I was in that just aired last week, we filmed that um, about three weeks prior to that in October. Um, but it's funny, that episode that just aired, I was a late addition to that. I knew oh. about a month ahead of time the range of dates that were filming the finale. We said, hey, yeah. just keep this date, uh, you know, range of dates in, in mind for this. We're not sure exactly when we're filming because um, they were going to be filming outdoors in Manhattan. So they had to like figure all that stuff out. Um, and then... Um, about three weeks earlier, or like, yeah, like just under a month, they had messaged me saying, hey, so they just added a scene into episode nine of the season where they need some lab techs and they want to bring you back. Are you available? And I was available. And I said, yes, but then I had to like 
and they said, great, it shoots on Tuesday. And it was like Thursday at this point. And I was like, I have to join SAG by Tuesday now because I did oh, wow. my 30 day thing and I called yeah. SAG and figured all that stuff up. And I was like, okay, here's the credit card. <laughs> uh, and a friend was very kind. And also I paid her back up and got that paycheck. Uh, uh-huh. But, um, but yeah, that was a, uh, that one especially was a whirlwind because I was like, okay, so I've got three weeks to join SAG. I'm going to have the money by this time. And then, right. Hey, actually we need you back next week. Wow. Uh, so that was a lot of fun and that was a huge episode um just in terms of scale that was my first stunt on set um my first time holding a gun on set uh, yeah how was really that yeah i saw that clip that you posted so how how was did you did you know going on on set that you would be doing all that uh so i knew because they had sent a script yeah. and i had looked through the script and i'm like my name i don't have any dialogue in the scene but i'm on the schedule to shoot this day i was like oh great so i'm in this big like sunday wow um in that one scene that was like the shootout and then mm-hmm. like the little bit of aftermath took the whole day it was a 14 hour day wow because there's so many people involved it was like right. the whole principal cast and then a bunch of us fbi come in versus a bunch of like you know terrorist goons right in the show so there was literally like 15 to 20 actors on set and you know all those angles all these stunts they have to reset sweep up the mess and then put new squibs everywhere to go off and explode and and all that stuff so that was just a very very long day um hmm. and i was like oh so this is what it's like because yeah. the episodes i had done before was only like one scene and i was done within like six hours or so but for this one, I'm like, oh, so this is what these guys do when you're like a regular. You're on set every day, all yeah. day, usually, yeah. depending on your on your role. But um, that was a lot of fun. That was super, super fun. Um, just getting to experience that and see what goes into it. And like the stunt coordinator, everyone's going to be super safe. Like, don't worry. And just knowing how to handle a gun on set and how cautious they are with all that stuff because there have been horrible accidents in the past. Um, not on that show, but in, in general. Right, right. Um, but it was just a lot of fun. That one was definitely the most fun I've had on the show because I got to learn so much. I got to like, it was a little glimpse of what it's like to like be a regular if you're on like an action type show like that. Totally. And honestly, like every time on set, you feel like you're learning something new because so much of it you can't really pick up in classes. There's just like, there, you're not going to have a class with like 40 crew members running around, <laughs> you know, trying to trying to uh, set up a shot. So you just don't know how this stuff works until you actually get that experience. Yeah. So um, let's, get, let's talk a little bit uh, again, back to musical theater, because that was what you grew up doing. And now you are in New York, which is kind of like the Mecca of musical theater. Yeah. And are you still trying to pursue that along with the film and TV career that you're, you're doing right now? Um, in a way. So because I now have reps that are in the TV film market. Mm-hmm. You know, doing a show is very um, time consuming, regardless of like the level, the scale, whether it's like a tiny 100 seat theater. A show, you mean a play, right? Yes, like a stage show, yeah. Yeah. Um, because you're rehearsing for so long. Right. And it's such a long process. A lot of like, you know, some of my reps have like written the contract, like, if you do a show, please make sure it's like, make sure it's worthwhile like yeah you're at the point where you don't really have to do those tiny shows anymore like you can go for the big like for the bigger leagues mm-hmm. um, or we can at least submit you for the bigger leagues um, mm-hmm. and while I very much love doing musical theater and I still you know sing and play piano while I'm, while I'm here I'm actually in Connecticut right now with my family um you know it was something that like for some reason in the back of my head when I was in college I was like I'm gonna be like a Broadway star but then I'm like well, you're not a dancer so there goes uh, a good handful of like the big dance heavy shows, but then there's shows like like Dear Evan Hansen or Phantom mm-hmm. of the Opera. There's not that much dancing involved. Mm-hmm. So it's like, well, there's still something out there for you. And there are a lot of plays that go on Broadway. Um, and it's not something that I've really actively pursued only because the audition process is also super time consuming. You could be waiting in line for hours and not get in the room because mm-hmm. a lot of them are open calls. There's no appointment. Mm-hmm. So it's also like, that's why so many theater actors um, work at night because they want their daytime available to go wait in line for these huge auditions and then stay for the dance call, which is at two o'clock, and then you're done at like five. Then they go work as a waiter or a bartender or something somewhere because that's like the flexible job that New York 
theater actors need. Um, and, you know, I work at a, or before COVID, I worked at a gym. So it's like, I opened up the gyms. I don't have the schedule to go to these huge open calls in Manhattan. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's just something that like, not necessarily putting on the back burner, but it's not really a priority because these other opportunities have opened up for me. But if the opportunity comes up to do like a play in Manhattan or a musical or film or something yeah. like that, like sing in a commercial, heck yeah, <laughs> I'm totally gonna do it. Yeah. Cause it's something that I'm still practicing and, and keeping alive. Cause you, know, okay. you very much can lose your singing, not necessarily singing ability, but very much your range if you don't mm. keep practicing it. It's yeah, it's always good. something that I've wondered in that because I'm not in that musical world at all, but uh, or really in the theater world. So I always wonder the people that you know moved to New York for acting if they can actively pursue both at the same time. Uh, because I always did understand that that a, a play does eat up a huge chunk of your schedule, um, and you can't really like once you sign on, you're committed, right? You're not just gonna back out to do something uh do you did you find any (laughs) what's that plenty have done that though oh yeah times that i'll see things like seeking immediately immediate replacements because like someone that is in the play that pays 500 dollars a week just booked a pilot in la and they're just like love you guys but i gotta go like yeah it's again like doing that thing that that um will take you that that next step for your career yeah yeah Yeah. um did you find any challenges when you kind of transitioned from doing almost only theater to auditioning for film and TV and doing on camera acting? Yes, there was a big one for me that my mentor thankfully does not tell me because I send him all my self tapes before I had a rep. And even now that I do have reps, I'm like, Hey, I just sent this thing for this show. Like I had my first series regular audition a few weeks ago mm-hmm. and sent it to him. I was like, what do you think? I haven't sent it in yet. So like, let me know what you think. Yeah. Um, and one of his biggest notes, you know, three, four years ago was always like, stop talking so fast. Because <laughs> mm. I have a tendency to talk quickly just because, you know, loud, rambunctious Spanish family. We just talk really fast. Mm. And very, we're a very uh, theatrical uh, ethnic group. So um, that was another big thing with theater. You're, you're taught to, you know, project your voice as much as possible to reach that back row of seats and mm-hmm. fill the space. And with TV, the close-up is right here so there's not much space to fill right so and you're, a lot and of you're that mic'd was, um, and you're mic'd right here yeah right there's a mic here and one just out of frame right. on the boom <laughs> yeah uh so that was a that was a big one too is just like learning like hey everything you learned in theater school still applies but bring the dial down to like 15 percent mm-hmm. and that's tv acting mm-hmm. and that took a while because my auditions were like you know they would say like submit a monologue and would send it in it was just like big and theatrical yeah. and they're like you taped this though this isn't in the audition room if it's like in the theater audition room like it's for a play or a musical then yeah fill the space because there's a mm-hmm. piano playing and they're drowning you out so you've got to be loud mm-hmm. and big but mm-hmm. for you know if you're in the audition room for a, a tv or film project they've got the camcorder on a really tight close-up so again it's like you've got to learn to like adjust and move those dials up and down depending on, on your situation um, and also learning about type, how in theater you can play anything and everything. Right. It does not work in TV and film. Um, you know, I have played several different ethnicities. I, the thing is, I'm not like tra- stereotypically Hispanic looking, um, mm-hmm. is what I've heard in New York and from everyone else. Uh, and I don't have an accent or anything like that, or I don't have a, a broken accent or anything. Um, so I have in theater, I've like played Italian before I've played Greek, I've played like Turkish right. or Mediterranean, that sort of region where they're like, there's a little color to like olive skin, but not like white. Um, in the, you know, with TV and film, it's a little bit different. Like you may get to play all these different age ranges cause you just add some gray to your hair and some wrinkles on your forehead yeah. for the play you're doing. But then for TV and film, like, no, they've got thousands of actors that are that age range. Right. right. They, cast someone that's not that right. and add extra work with makeup and all that stuff. Um, so that was a big learning process too. was like, you can't play everything. In mm-hmm. TV and film. There are mm-hmm. more than enough actors to pick and choose from. Well, with your small town community theater, there's a very small select group of people mm-hmm. to choose from. So they make it work. So TV and film, you know, it's that times a thousand, if not more. So mm-hmm. that was a big, a big lesson for me was learning type and, um, 
marketing myself too was a big one how for theater it's like you have your headshot and it's just like a pretty picture of you in front of a backdrop but with tv and film it's like it has to reflect that type that we talked about and reflect the environment you might be in is it like urban is it um like socialite is it right. are you the techie are you the jock are you the popular girl are you the yeah. villain all these different things that don't at all apply <laughs> to theater yeah into that world of auditioning either it's just like here's what i look like because here's what i'm gonna look like when i walk in the room versus here's all the different types of characters i can play yeah, yeah. you know one thing that i just thought of that i've been wanted to ask actors in new york is the the terminology for tv and film is it legit yes because yeah, yeah so i actually learned that not too long ago as well oh really uh, until I got my manager, who is a bi-coastal manager. He's in LA and in, in New York. Um, uh -huh. They have offices on both coasts. So, yeah, I learned that theatrical in New York means theater, Broadway. Right. Meanwhile, theatrical everywhere else means, like, movie theater, like, theatrical. Right. It's, like, commercial and theatrical, while in New York it's commercial and legit. Because legit meaning screen acting, and then there's a the theatrical stuff for, for Broadway and off-Broadway. Um, I think that's maybe like one of the few terms that does change depending on, on your market. I can't really think of any others. Yeah. That's the only one that I really, uh, that I know of. And I, I didn't know that until, you know, a couple of years ago as well yeah. from like a friend that had moved to New York and was like, Oh, I didn't, you know, I didn't know this. Uh, so, so here's a, a quick thing uh, about New York. So let's say, and I know you're not like a New York veteran. You've been there a, a, a little while, but not like not like around. your whole life. But um, I'm still I'm, I'm sure you could still give advice to someone who would be brand new, right? Who who would um, who might be thinking about moving there. So imagine like if I were where I was uh, before coming to Atlanta. I had grown up in a small market in Ohio, and mm -hmm. I was thinking about moving to a big market. And what if right now I'm, I, I asked you, I say, hey, I'm, I'm thinking about moving from Cleveland to New York to pursue acting. Is there any, are there any like big pieces of advice that you would give to someone who wants to do that? Like what, saving up money? Like, I'm sure that, that's a big thing for everybody, but uh, other than that. Thing, and, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the first thing is just because of New York. I mean, the, it, it sort of balances out because like the minimum wage here is $15, while in Connecticut, it's still like 10 something. Mm. Um, but the cost of living is also more so it like it you know it, the inflation it does like sort of balance out um with new york it's also just get used to not having a lot of space because everything is tiny every apartment is way smaller mm. like a house the size of my parents would easily be like i don't know 800k or like a million in new yeah. york just because the the square footage price is ridiculous in right. where it is Right. Um, and I tell people how much I pay for rent and they're like, I'm paying my apartment for that. I'm like, stop it. Yeah. I don't want to hear it. Right. It in. Um, that really is a big one is just have a financial and that's moving to LA as well. I've read a few different like actor biography or autobiographies or memoirs. And their big thing was like, they made sure to move with a cushion of savings mm -hmm. because you might not even be able to land a part-time job immediately. Mm -hmm. Um, that was a big thing for me. I, I had two job interviews for like both part-time jobs um, just prior to moving. It was like a very hectic two weeks. That's like when I just got my rep, I was ready to move. And I was also interviewed, like going back and forth to New York for job interviews to just have something because I knew like, just because you move to New York doesn't mean you're going to immediately make your living as an actor. So you need a fallback plan. And you also don't want to drain your savings. For yeah. Um, so that really is a big one is, um, is, is, just finances and being smart. Yeah. That's a sort of a big philosophy of mine is be the smart actor because so many people are like, I'm doing it, I'm moving to Hollywood. And I'm like, you don't know anyone out there. You don't have any money. You don't have any reps. Like you're going out there with like not much besides your drive and motivation, but that, you know, not having, not auditioning and not getting to work in your field can be very like soul draining. Yeah. And very impactful. Like when you hit like a slump right now, everybody's, most actors are just like depressed right now because we're not able to work. Yeah, yeah. We're just like, when is this happening? But then we're also like, we also don't want to die. Yeah. Um, so um, I would say that's, that's probably my biggest um, advice for anyone moving to New York or LA because LA is also pretty expensive. 
um, is just try and plan your finances as best as possible so that that's not an added stress on top of finding totally. prep, auditioning, waking up early, staying in shape, yeah. living on your own for the first time. Me moving to Brooklyn a year ago was my first time living on my own. Mm -hmm. I lived with my parents until I was 25. So a lot of big changes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, and I, but I agree I've with that. been like a lone, a lone wolf kind of. Okay. I'd always been a very independent kid. So moving wasn't so much of, um, of a culture shock for me because I'd also mm. been commuting back and forth to New York for like two and a half years before moving. So I knew the subway system. I knew how to get around and all that stuff. Um, so it wasn't as much of a culture shock for me as it might be for some people. It also mm -hmm. wasn't like a cross country move. It was like my parents right. drove me an hour and a half and dropped me off and, and that's it. It wasn't like your parents are dropping you to the airport and like sadly waving goodbye and you're going from, you know, Philly to LA or something. It wasn't as drastic of a change. And I can still just take the train an hour and a half and come see my family once a month or on the weekend. Yeah, that's a, I think that's a big thing. Cause that's almost, to me, that was like kind of my, what my college experience was like. I went to college about two hours away from where I lived at, um, mm -hmm. where I grew up. So I could, if I wanted to go home on the weekends, you know, and, and still spend some time with family. So I think that that does help a lot. Uh, and, and I totally agree with you, saving up money when you move, even coming to Atlanta, you know, if you're moving to any market, you know, if you're, you're picking up and moving and starting, kind of like starting your life over in a new place, you do have to have that savings because no matter where you go, it's not like you're just going to pick up exactly where you left off, where you used to be, whether that's, whether that's acting or whether that's, you know, working another job and just, uh, having the money to, to survive and to be able to pay rent and eat. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, all right, let's actually, uh, transition over to podcast because you have this, sure. this podcast that you started not too long ago. You're on your, uh, 10th episode. So by the time people are watching this on YouTube, the interview that you did with me will have, right. will have aired. So, um, that was really cool being on your podcast and it's something, uh, fairly new to you. So, uh, tell me how you started that. So, um, I had wanted, I think I have on my phone still some like, you know, podcast art I made up, like a little uh, picture that I had of like myself, but like the show's like art and logo. And I was like, coming November 15th, <laughs> never happened. Uh -huh. It didn't launch until May because um, I, I was so, obs not obsessed, but I was so preoccupied with like working my job at the gym and trying to save money and save money because I hadn't moved with this huge cushion of savings. I didn't you know, take mine if I had something. I had a couple months rent saved up, but yeah. not as much as people would say. A lot of people would say like try and save up a year. Yeah, yeah. If you can just to right. have it. Um so I was working myself like that I was just exhausted and I was like I do not have time to sit here for an hour and try and stay awake and talk to people because I was opening <laughs> up the gym and opened up at 5 a.m. So I was up early. Oh, day. wow. Um, you know, my work day was done at like noon, but it's still like very taxing because then you're like, all right, now I got to go work out because I'm an actor and I got to look good on camera and now I got to go grocery shopping and go spend time with my boyfriend and then go, do, you know, just all these different things that were like pulling me. Nothing was really acting related. So it's like yeah. all this stress that I put on myself. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to start the podcast initially because I just generally love talking to actors mm -hmm. about, because like, like you said, our paths are very different. And I don't think any two paths are alike. Right. Everyone's is different. Like I know people that, you know, booked their first commercial at five years old. I know others who retired and then started pursuing their lifelong dream of acting and have gone on to actually work and book things. Yeah. Um, and you know, like my best friend is like from West Virginia and his upbringing and his, the culture down there was a little bit different than me in suburban Connecticut. And, um, but I just genuinely love talking to actors. And, and one of my side gigs was working as a writer for this website called Media Village. Mm -hmm. um, and I would get to interview actors a lot because there would be like panels and stuff like that or interviews for a show that was coming up. So I'd get to talk with some actors. And, but those are always like sound bites, like quick 15 minute conversations to just pull a couple quotes for the article. Um, and I'm like, I want to talk more and talk with people who aren't like at the top level, they're going to give some inspiring words that doesn't right. relate to anyone because they were in that position like 30 years ago. Like, yeah. you know, it, the, the, the landscape of the business changes so often that I wanted to talk with people who are like in the thick of it, like right now, um, you know, like you, like you're still 
you know, yeah. none of us have been series regulars yet. We've right. been recurring on some shows and booked other stuff. Um, but we're still like looking for that shot um, to, to have, to finally be able to like, just be like an official working actor. Like I'm mm-hmm. on this show and this is all I do. I don't have to go do my writing job. I don't have to work at the mm-hmm. gym. I don't have to bartend. I don't have to do the headshots. You know, it's like everyone that's pretty much everyone's like goal is to just be yeah. like an actor in that fit. Yeah. Um, so I really wanted to start the podcast to talk with people about how they got started and um, what advice they have for young actors and just have conversations about about how they view the business. I mean, the podcast is called Actors with Issues. So a lot yeah. of times I'll be like, all right, what's your beef with the business? Like, what do you, what, what bothers you? For some people, it's representation, which is a huge conversation for anyone mm-hmm. that's not a white actor. All of our communities are very underrepresented. Um, or people in the LGBTQ plus community who want to talk about representation from that angle um, or mm-hmm. about ageism and just all these different things that we don't really think about. Um, yeah. We think like, Hollywood, that acting is Hollywood, and that's it. And it's red carpet and glam and Brad Pitt and George Clooney, and like you know. But that's not at all what it is. And I just wanted my podcast to be somewhere for people to like listen to these conversations with actors that are like, look, they're making it work. They're okay. So if you make it work, you're gonna be okay. Like, yeah. it's especially for young actors and young artists who don't really know where to go um, in terms of like finding advice. Because I found that a lot of young actors have this jaded point of view because they got advice from someone who's not at all involved with the business Mm -hmm. they'll be like i've heard people spout statistics like oh only like five percent of actors uh make it like make what does that mean make it what is what's the threshold for making it (laughs) is it making like 50k a year as actors is it being like you know you can't leave your house in public because that's how famous you are now like and you know just certain statistics like that or they'll say like oh if you're like if you're gay and actor you'll never make a career and i'm like i can name like 50 gay actors right now who are like yeah. a-listers yeah or you know um if you're a person of color you can't make it as big as them and i'm like well that whole landscape is changing right now yeah. too representation is increasing across the board it's not where it should be but it's still it's better than where it was five years ago alone um but i really want my podcast to be that because i hadn't had the chance to talk with actors um in just a casual manner in a long format always been these quick Mm -hmm. 10 15 minute interviews um so i really just wanted it to be to be that to have like long casual real conversations about anything having to do with the business and with their careers yeah and i think it's it's really important and i agree with you that uh for people, especially younger actors, or not necessarily younger, but just people who are starting out in the industry. Because like you said, there are plenty of people that start out later in life, uh, but to have a place where they can get actual information from people that are working in the industry, because they they do get some bad information at times. And sometimes even it comes from, like you said, it comes from celebrities who are way up there right now, but they haven't been, down there in the trenches for decades and they don't really know what it's like anymore. And to get people's advice, it's really timely advice that can, that they can use, they can put to use right away on what acting classes they might want to pursue, you know, how they can go about putting together a pitch package to get an agent, to get representation, you know, those types of things that you can really only get from people who are working in the industry right now because they know what's happening, you know, at the moment rather than something that worked for, you know, somebody decades and decades ago. So I think it's really cool. And I really like also, you've only had a, a, a handful, like I'm, my episode was at episode 10 of your podcast. Yeah. yeah. I think so. Um, in double digits, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, uh, but even, even with just the 10 episodes, I think you've got a quite a variety of people. And even like the last episode that, that you had was a writer who um, I believe wrote something that you also acted in, right? Yeah. So that's uh, that's really interesting to also hear from that point of view. Um, that's something that I want to do here on my YouTube channel as well, is to start talking to people that are industry professionals, not necessarily just actors, because we can learn a lot from, you know, how collaborative this this career can be and uh, the whole filmmaking and movie making business. Yeah, that was a big thing for, for my podcast was, talking with people who weren't just actors um like yeah. Michaela who um you know went to school for theater in Greece and 
she also got her business degree. And that's also really interesting is talking with people who have a background in business. And I always ask them like, how did you take that knowledge from your business world or marketing or whatever mm. and apply it to your, to your acting career? And a lot of times those are the most successful actors that I know because mm. it's like, well, I know that it's all about branding. There's an actor, you're a brand, you're the CEO of your acting. It's a startup. And you know, when you're, your headshot is your logo and your, you know, it's like all this different stuff that actors don't really think about. We just think, I need a headshot picture. And then that's it. Like, uh, yeah. but it's like, it's really capturing your brand. Like, is this picture who's going to walk in the room? Like I said earlier. Um, and, um, with, with Mikhail and with a few other people, they've also produced their own work because that's a big way for actors to get seen is by mm -hmm. writing and producing your own stuff. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, our iPhones have 4k cameras on them. Yeah. Like it's insane how, how powerful these cameras are now. And you can just edit everything on iMovie and make a quick five minute short film or a funny sketch series or something just with you and your roommates or your siblings yeah. or your actor buddies and whatever. Um, and that's a big thing too, was then you submit that to festivals. And if that picks up steam, then an agent might express interest or another casting director might see it and call you in for something. And um, it's taking initiative. And, and that's a big thing yeah. um, that I think young actors have to know is that, you know, you are your own CEO and you are the product of your, you're everything. You're the, you're the spokesman, the product and the yeah. CEO of your acting business. And even so if you I get like a rep, it's like, they're a partner. They're not going to exactly. take over everything. Exactly. And I mean, I even go as far as to say that your reps, like you don't work for your agent, your agent works for you. Like they're, yeah. they're there to um, help you build your career, but they're not the, you know, they're not the, the top of everything. You have to be the, um, the leader of it all. And, and like you said earlier, I mean, they just get the 10%. So you better be doing 90% of the work for your right. career. Um, all right. This was, this has been great. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to borrow from your podcast and oh because <laughs> I, I'm, I'm guessing all of your rapid fire questions that you do at the end are things that you've thought about for yourself. So I'm going to, I'm going to hit you with some of those. <laughs> well, let's start with one that's not on your rapid fire, but feel free to um, add it to your list if you want to. Sure. So in a parallel universe where you are not an actor, what do you think you would be doing? See, I always, I've always wanted to ask this. Um, simple answer is a chef. Oh, okay. Um, because my dad's a chef and I grew up around a lot of cooks and chefs and food yeah. and I love to cook. Wow. Um, a lot of times my Instagram story is like, this is dinner like look what i mean and it's not just like a grilled cheese it's like no i love to cook so. yeah um very cool and and i hate when like i ask that question sometimes and people be like oh maybe a director and i'm like no no that's a cop-out answer yeah. no industry related stuff yeah a producer a writer like no no what outside the box if the arts do not exist what would you be doing mm -hmm. <laughs> culinary arts i guess is culinary it is called <laughs> culinary arts uh, i think i would i think i would be a pilot uh I've never, okay. I've never taken flight lessons, but that was actually one of my goals for 2020 was to start taking flight lessons. And then all this crap happened and uh, I couldn't get yeah. that started. So maybe so fingers crossed. Yeah. Fingers crossed in 2021, I'm going to start taking my first flight lessons and get that started. Okay. Uh, all right. So theater or screen? Screen. Screen. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, all right. Better. <laughs> so, okay. So, uh, so now that we are on screen, then TV or film? TV. Hero or villain? Villain. They're more interesting. They are more interesting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, drama or comedy? Drama. I think I'm a funny person, but not, <laughs> not that funny. Yeah. I like drama. It's pretty. So, uh, what would you say has been your worst survival job? Jesus. Um, uh, being a, it was a very fun job, but just of all the lists of the ones that I have, the worst one was being like a superhero slash mascot for kids' birthday parties. Oh, I know plenty of people that do that here in Atlanta. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I had to be in a mascot costume for an outdoor birthday party in like 90 degree humid weather. And I was like, oh, yeah. I'm losing 12 pounds just being in the sauna right now. Yeah. Um, but I've also got to be like Darth Vader and Batman. So I'm like, hey, oh, like there's a, there's a bucket list. <laughs> there, yeah, there are trade-offs for sure. Okay, so uh, do you have a book recommendation for any new actor? And actually, not just book, like any resource, uh, book, podcast, other than uh, other than yours. 
anything that you recommend? <laughs> Book, definitely um, The Actor's Life, A Survival Guide by Jenna Fisher. She oh. plays Pam on The Office. Yeah. Look at this, right, on, <laughs> right there, right on my desk. There it is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I finished reading it uh, about a month ago and had bought a bunch of technique books too um, mm -hmm. and found it super insightful and much like um, your YouTube channel and like my podcast, it's just like the perspective of an actor, like she kept journals and all of these things, so she was able to refer to it. It wasn't like this sort of like, not jaded, but um, warped point of view. It's like, no, mm -hmm. I remember being a starving artist for eight years, pilots and occasional guest star roles and co-stars and just mm -hmm. not being able to to land that series regular. And I'm eight years, I'm like, all right, buckle up on because you're three years in. So. Right. Yeah. And so it's, it's what I found really interesting that I liked in the in the book is that the way that she found her agents, like her first agents, was that it, it wasn't like it wasn't her out there pursuing the agent. It was there out. She was out there pursuing her craft and she actually she was acting in shows that she wasn't expecting an agent to be at. But I think it was I think it was somebody was there to see one of their actors and then they saw her there perform and and has to represent her so that's yeah. um some things that i think people uh don't don't really think about they think you okay the only way to get representation is to go on the agent's website and to submit that way but right. to, to be out there put yourself out there as much as possible and maybe somebody will see you uh okay so is there a role that got away mm, ndas we can't talk about it um but just oh. a, um a series for a major franchise. Hmm. Yeah. Did you audition very for vague, it? Then... Very weird script. Because it's it's all NDA. They don't really tell you what it is. There's no yeah. character names. It's the most like vague like two person scene. You just have to, as an actor, you just gotta like. There's nothing going on here. I gotta just make a decision. Think of a backstory and and, and a moment. So you didn't know what it was for, and then later on, did you find out what that? show was no, it hasn't come out yet because oh. of covid they had to like stop production for all those projects that were in i got you i got you um, but that was like my first like major project audition gotcha mm. besides blind spot because that was like a network show right um, right well, blind spot is a huge that's a big deal that's nothing small for sure <laughs> uh, especially a, especially a multi-episode recurring character on there yeah. yeah uh okay so what current tv show do you want to join the cast of Mandalorian. Oh man, I have not watched that yet. I just finished watching it. It's so good. So I'm trying to decide right now between uh, right now I only have Netflix as far as like a streaming subscription. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to I'm thinking about getting another one. I'm trying to decide between Disney Plus and HBO. I'm leaning towards HBO right now uh, mm -hmm. because there just seems to be so much more on on Disney Plus. There is the Mandalorian. There's a bunch of like old Disney stuff, like the the nostalgic stuff that I would like to see. Yeah. But uh, I think uh, some of the more interest, more things that I'm interested in are on HBO right now. So it might be a while before I see The Mandalorian. Yeah, with Disney Plus, it's just, I mean, you can just get the free 30 days and just binge it and then cancel it. That's true. <laughs> yeah, um, that's with true. With Disney Plus, it's so much of their original programming was put to halt. They had like four or five like Marvel series that they yeah. were planning and the right. season two of The Mandalorian and right. some other original shows. Um, so why the Mandalorian for you? Because it's like it was turning Star Wars like on its head. It's like no lightsabers, no mm -hmm. force. I mean, a little bit of force magic, Baby Yoda, because it's Baby right. Yoda. And, yeah. But it wasn't. It wasn't the typical thing. It was like smaller scale. It was still pretty epic, but it was like a character-driven, cool Star Wars drama, and it felt like a western as well because cool. it's like this like lone wolf who's like the cowboy who walks into town it's like no he's a bounty hunter and yeah. it was just like seeing a couple roles throughout the show that had like a one episode arc or like the guest star for that episode i'm like man that would have been such a cool thing to do like this one episode of this show and work for a couple weeks and like just be a tiny part of something so huge it's what it felt like with blind spots like i am the tiny like i'm one pixel yeah on this 4k yeah. <laughs> tv that is blind spots um, but yeah, the Mandalorian is such great storytelling, and I love yeah. John Favreau. He directed like Iron Man movies, and mm -hmm. he's just a great director. And he wrote the show and created it too. Um, well, you're doing a good job selling it. Now I'm thinking about switching to Disney Plus <laughs> and, and going to watch it. Uh, okay, so here's one: 
what is your favorite accent to do and can you do it right now? Oh God. Um, I mean, the British accents are always fun. It depends on which one exactly. Um, the British accent I don't think is done very much is sort of like, it's, um, kind of like the lower class, not necessarily Cockney because that's more like a, a time period. Okay. So it's like, it's sort of taught like this, you know, it's like they're from a bit, not in London, but they're a bit like farther out. Yeah. It's like, it's weird. It's like the Southern accent of, <laughs> right, right. Of, of London, uh, of what they think of like, oh, they're not like the bougie people from like the Northeast or from the West Coast. Um, Have you broken out any accents for film and TV auditions? Um, only one that required it. There was okay. one that was, his character was a Mexican immigrant. So I just had to like, um, I was speaking a bit like this, just sort of like a, a, gotcha. a lot of ends in between the words and just sort of very fluid talking and things like that, you know, but I'm not a master at that at all. I was very uncomfortable for that stuff. I'm like, this is stem the same because I don't, that was right before COVID. So it probably never got made. Um, <laughs> I feel like that with my Chinese accent, if people wanted me to do a Chinese accent, I feel like I can kind of do it, but I'm just mimicking my mom or my dad and <laughs> And I, I almost feel bad about it. I feel like I'm making fun of it when I do it, you know? And yeah. it, to me, it doesn't sound great, but I think for most people, they can't really tell the difference. They think it sounds, right. you know, uh, pretty But it's pretty funny, at the same time, you're like, but people talk like that. I'm not making yeah, fun of them. Right. Just, it sounds a little character but that's how people talk. Yeah, exactly. Uh, all right, so what movie franchise would you like to join? We're doing a Star Wars show already, so let's say Marvel. Marvel. It's like the only cool. major franchise. Like it's like that or Fast and the Furious, and I don't want to do that one. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any specific Marvel? I mean, Marvel's got you know all kinds of uh, different spinoffs mm. now. So Just anything. Spider-Man. Just Spider-Man yeah. Because it's New York, yeah. and it's like a, it's like a teenager, and these are like real people. It's not like no right. aliens or cosmic yeah. nothing. It's not Guardians of the Galaxy or anything like that. Yeah. Um, I would have said like the Captain America or Iron Man franchises, but those are gone. So. But those are gone. Yeah. Uh, here, so. All right. So, uh, do you have a theater dream role that you would like to play? Phantom of the Opera. Hmm. Yeah. That's Very been cool. A dream role since I first saw the show when I was like, I think sixteen or seventeen. Um. I'm glad you mentioned like one of the four musicals that I've seen (laughs) in my life. So I'm like, okay, I I know what you're talking about. (laughs) Yeah. That one or Les Mis. I want to play Javert in in Les Mis. Okay. Well, that's not one that I've seen. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, there's a bunch of different versions out there. There's like the movie with Hugh Jackman and then there's like a concert production. But with that character specifically, He's not the villain of the story, but he's tainted as it. But he's this black and white character that, like, the tiniest bend breaks him. It's like, there, he's like, I am the law, and the law is not mocked, and that is what I'm here. You're a criminal, I'm taking you to jail. And what he's mm-hmm. like, but this guy's not just a criminal, he's like a good person and is trying to save this other person. It's like, it's, it's just such a complex character, and there's layers to it. It's right. not just because then he eventually snaps, and, mm-hmm. you know. He thinks like his world comes crumbling down because he's like everything I thought was black and white. There's so much gray to it, and I don't like it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that sounds like a really um, layered characters are always always cool. Uh, all right, so if you were to build a movie that you would be a part of, what genre would it be? What director would it be, and who would be your co-star? See, this one is a recent addition, so I haven't really thought about this. Uh, <laughs> uh, for genre, definitely a drama. Um, maybe like a thriller, like a fast-paced like thriller. Not necessarily mm-hmm. an action movie, but a, definitely a thriller. Something where there's like some type of like fight involved or something cool, like st- something kind of stunt. Like a get out type of thriller? Get out! It was kind Ooh, of yeah, horror like Not necessarily yeah. a horror. Movie. Yeah, but it's yeah. that's like a yeah. I would do like psychological thriller. Like yeah, really okay. Another layered piece. It's not just like murderer and it's like yeah. Oh, there's some other stuff going on. Um, director. Dang it. Who? See, I want to say like a comedy director because comedy directors are always such great, like 
thriller director. Um, Taika Waititi. I really like Taika Waititi. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He's, his his stuff is really good. His yeah. He has like that sort of cathartic humor in his in his shows or in his movies. Mm-hmm. Um, and co-star. Dang it, this is hard. Psychological thriller directed by Taika Waititi, starring Juan and Ella and Kurt Ewey. Why not? Hey. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm on for that movie. <laughs> okay, so in 10 words or less, what advice would you give to an up-and-coming actor today? Be smart. Build your village. I love that. And you're just getting started. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> All right. So do you have anything else coming up other than uh, where people can watch you at, uh, on blind spot right now? They can check out your podcast actors with issues on anywhere where podcasts are, are streamed and anything else coming up that you can talk about. Um, I have a brief cameo appearance in the blind spot finale, which airs um, on whatever the date is for next Thursday. I think it's the 27th. I'm not okay. Sure. 25th, something like that. Um, that's kind of it. Yeah. I mean, there hasn't really been anything else. Um, going. I mean, a few things that were in the festival circuit, but those aren't like widely accessible to anyone. Um, yeah, that's it. Follow me on Great. Instagram. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. And I'll put, I'll put your links to your Instagram and your podcast and everything down in the description of this video. So that's great. Thanks. Thanks again for joining me here, Juan. Uh, no problem, man. That was awesome. it'd be great once production picks up back again. If you book anything down here in Atlanta, maybe we can meet in person or vice versa. If I head up to New York at some point, Absolutely. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'd love to meet you in person. All right. Thank you, man. Thanks so much, man. Take care. All right. That was my interview with Juan Ayala. I want to thank Juan one more time for joining me. And I want to thank you for sticking around all the way to the end. If you have any questions, make sure to leave them down in the comments below. And remember that Juan's social media links are down in the description. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and remember to subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. Until next time, keep practicing, keep learning, and I hope to see you on set one day.